your questions about your sexual health and sexual priorities, needs and preferences are the basis of these podcasts. And because of that, I want to answer some really important questions that have come up over the past few weeks since I started doing this podcast. Hi, I'm Dr. Neelima Deshpande, and this is V for Vagina, the podcast that dispels myths and misunderstandings about the vagina and empowers women to embrace their sexual energy, vitality, and well-being. In this podcast, I'm accompanied by Niranjan Medekar, the CEO and founder of Sounds Great, the company that helps me create and market this podcast. Niranjan is an amazing creator, writer, columnist, and an author. He's here today to help me sort through the hundreds of questions I've started to get on social media and as well as in response to the podcasts I've done here before. A lot of these questions are very personal, very intimate, and I needed help to sort them out. Thank you, Niranjan, for helping me to answer these questions. Thank you, Nilima, ma'am. I'm back with some more questions. And our today's questions are focused on vaginal health. The first question is from one of our listeners. I tend to get yeast infections after sex. So I rinse out my vagina with water after sex and it seems to have solved the problem. What are your thoughts? This is an interesting question because I have addressed it once before. The reason you get yeast infections after sex or after a period or maybe uh, worse during pregnancy or lactation is because of the change in the pH of the vagina. Uh, The more alkaline your pH gets, the worse the yeast infections get. Uh, It also means as your vagina becomes more alkaline, the normal acid-producing bacteria in the vagina decrease. And when those bacteria decrease, any kind of yeast or fungal spores there tend to grow. Now, it's very true that All women, you know, we have this vaginal microbiome which consists of some fungi and bacteria and stuff like that. And there's a healthy balance between these when our hormone health is at its optimal. Now, when you wash out your vagina, you don't just wash out the yeast, you actually wash out the healthy bacteria as well. Particularly if you're using things like soap or you're using some medication over the counter. I know a lot of women use douches made of betadine, which actually initially might feel that it's working because it's uh, an antiseptic, anti-infective kind of agent, but it also kills the healthy bacteria. And unless your perineal hygiene is good, unless your diet is very good, unless you're well hydrated and you're not loaded with sugar, your body will not restore your vaginal microbiome to its optimal level. So I would suggest that, yes, temporarily putting your fingers inside and washing out your vagina might feel like it's working, but the reason you're getting recurrent vaginal yeast infections is probably because of this practice. So my suggestion would be is to avoid using soap or water to wash inside the vagina. The vagina is a self-cleaning organ and it works perfectly well if you leave it alone. If you have an infection, uh, it's important to get the infection treated, but it's also important to look at why the infection happened in the first place. Maybe you had a course of antibiotics for a tooth infection or maybe a throat infection or a bad cough. I know a lot of young women who have acne or trouble with skin infections or hair infections often get a course of antibiotics and you can end up with yeast infections in the vagina and sometimes even in the mouth. Um, It's important to look at what caused the yeast infection. If you're an older woman and you're diabetic, then that may also be the cause of your yeast infections. Um, So be cautious about what you're doing inside the vagina. If, if you don't suffer with any of these problems, go get checked out, get investigated, tested. If there is an infection, your doctor can treat it. But for sure, get back to restoring your health and that will restore your vaginal health. Okay. Actually, you mentioned about douching and vagina wash. But the next question is exactly about the same. So the question is like this. Can we wash the vagina with V-wash? This is interesting because I've already addressed that the vagina and the vulva 
are two separate areas. The vulva is the skin on the outside. So the hair bearing area, the outer lips, the inner lips, this is all part of the vulva. The vagina is the organ inside the body from where your period blood comes out or where you have intercourse. V-wash, although it's called V-wash, was never designed to be used inside the vagina. It's designed for the outside. Um, it is pH neutral, not pH acidic, which your vulva is. So normal vulval pH is between 3.5 and 4.5, whereas V-wash and many vulva washes are pH neutral, which means their pH is 7, which means it's still a little bit more alkaline than it should be. You can use uh, V-wash on the outside. Don't use it inside the vagina. So you can use it to clean the vulva. Make sure you just use lukewarm water. I would uh, resist using it every day. So you might want to use V-Wash, say, when you're on your period. Or uh, you want to clean up, say, uh, after sex. Um, I would avoid using it every day and all the time. Most of the time, you should just be using plain lukewarm water to clean. And that's more than enough. Uh, if you find that your vulva is smelly or you have discomfort down there, then it may be that the bacterial population around the hair bearing area is what's causing the smell. Just like you get body odor, you know, from armpits, sweaty armpits, you can have um, an odor coming from the bacteria that populate the hair bearing area of the vulva. In which case, just washing with normal soap and water is good enough. You don't need a separate kind of V wash to clean it. Okay. The next question is about lubricants. Can you suggest some natural lubricants for vaginal dryness? We have covered vaginal dryness in a previous podcast, but I will answer this briefly and say the most natural lubricant you can find is saliva. <laughs> and most people are a bit shocked about this. They say, saliva? That simple? Yeah, it's available to you all the time. It doesn't cost any money. And um, you can use it. The only downside of using saliva is if you're having sex with somebody you don't know their sexual history about, then even the saliva can give you an infection. Now, um, other uh, remedies or lubricants that are available over the counter in most pharmacies uh, are water-based lubricants, which are things like KY jelly or lubic gel. Um, you can look up natural lubricants which are available on uh, sites that sell lubricants, either various sex sites or even on you know common commercial sites where you buy products from. I would suggest looking up the ingredients. Uh, when you look at the ingredients, if it contains glycerin or potato starch, avoid those lubricants because even though they are water-based, the, the glycerin and the potato starch are not very microbe-friendly. So when you use them inside your vagina, you might find that, you know, it smells a bit more. Or if, you, if you're somebody who has bacterial vaginosis or other infections, it tends to f increase uh, in, in amount when you use these lubricants. You might find that it becomes a little bit itchy or you burn a little bit more. Um, the key is vaginal moisturizers are different from lubricants so vaginal moisturizers for women who have dryness down there so you might end up having a dry vagina either because you're menopausal or because you're on medication that causes dryness so um, certain drugs that are used to control bladder symptoms certain antidepressants uh, even some oral contraceptives can make you feel dry and uncomfortable if you're diabetic your vagina can feel drier and also get infected more easily. If you have problems with hypertension and are on some kinds of antihypertensive medication, uh, especially diuretics, also you can experience vaginal dryness and dryness in, in your mouth. So these uh, problems need vaginal moisturizers, which you need to use regularly, not just when you're having sex. Different markets across the world will have vaginal moisturizers. You want a moisturizer that is pH adapted to the vagina, is a little bit acidic. Um, for menopausal women, this can be something like lactacid. It can be things like Replens and Balance Active. There is um, a wide range of products available for menopausal women and for premenopausal women. Many times, vaginal moisturizers are often marketed as vaginal tightening agents. 
And remember, there's nothing that can tighten the vagina other than surgery. Uh, all of these products increase the moisture and um, turgidity of the cells of the vagina, so it feels like it's tighter. What the, what can tighten is your pelvic floor muscles, but not the vagina itself. So uh, these are different kinds of products. They come under different names. And if you type, oh, I want a vaginal moisturizer, and you don't immediately get a product list, you can also type in vaginal moisturizers for vaginal tightening. And sometimes that will give you a different kind of product list. Once again, make sure you check the ingredient list. And make sure it doesn't have potato starch. The reason I say this is because... Um, mm, a lot of moisturizers that are lying around the house, things like aloe vera gels, many kind of uh, gels, and have potato starch as a carrier because it makes the product gloopy. Typically, gels that are used in large quantity, for example, ultrasound gels and gels that are used for ECG machines, etc., have potato starch in them because they're not meant to be used inside the body. So it's very important when you choose a vaginal moisturizer or lubricant, you check that it's um, approved for use inside the body. Thanks for that, ma'am. The next question is, can you suggest something for the darkness of vagina and skin around it? When you look at the human body, certain areas of the body are meant to be more pigmented than other parts of the body. For example, the areas around the nipple, under the armpits, uh, around the genitals, Maybe even the skin around your elbows and knees, around your ankles, uh, where your fingers, joints are, where your toes are. So some areas of the body typically have more pigment. Now, when you look at your genitals and you say, oh my God, they're darker than before and I want something to lighten it, then the question is, is it just natural darkness that you're finding offensive or is there an infection? Because skin infections also lead to the skin changing in color, in texture, and uh, in flexibility. Typically, fungal infections are associated with changes in color and texture of the skin. If it's a fungal infection and the skin has changed in architecture, then you need to see uh, a doctor who specializes in skin infections to get that treated. You also need to stop doing the things that make fungal infections worse, which is using very tight leggings or synthetic underwear or tight jeans that don't allow the sweat to evaporate and allow the fungus there to proliferate on the skin. Also, getting rid of sugar from your diet. And if you're diabetic, making sure your diabetic control is very good. Uh, if none of these is the problem, then you want to ask, well, why is it that I want to lighten this area? Where did this message come from that it needs to be a certain color, a texture, or an appearance? And I would invite you to look at uh, the vulva library. Uh, which is available online. And it's a collection of different kinds of vulvas from all across the globe. And you can probably have a look at it and say, well, actually, I'm normal. Everything's normal. It doesn't have to meet some kind of standard of color and appearance and structure. And the more normal you can view your anatomy and your body, the more at ease you'll feel. Even so, there is a new upcoming branch of cosmetic gynecology, which really deals with these kind of insecurities and problems that people might have. There are some cases where a lightening of the skin might improve the body image or the way you look at your skin. It could be something to do with scars or keloids or uh, you know some kind of injuries that have happened that made the skin increase or change in pigmentation. Or maybe some patches of pigment aren't sufficient, so you want to lighten the rest of the area of the skin. In cosmetic gynecology clinics, lasers are often used to lighten the skin color. Uh, I would recommend against using facial skin lightening creams uh, on the vulva. The skin of the vulva is incredibly delicate. It's actually more delicate than the skin of your face. So try to avoid using such creams on the vulva. The vagina itself doesn't need any kind of treatments, lightening or darkening, because the vagina is the part of your body that's inside your body. Thank you for the detailed answer, ma'am. The next question. Do you please suggest vaginal cream for dryness during menopause? I think I've partially answered this question before and also in one of our previous episodes where I've talked about uh, vaginal dryness, tightening and shortening as we go through menopause. 
There are two important aspects to menopause. The first is vaginal moisturizers and the second is vaginal estrogen. Uh, vaginal moisturizers are available over the counter and don't need a prescription. So products like Replens, Lactacid, uh, to wash the area of the vulva and vagina, um, products like Balance Active, all of these products will help the moisture in the vagina and to reduce the sensations of dryness, pain, discomfort uh, in the vagina as well as when passing urine. Vaginal estrogen will need to be prescribed by your doctor. So you need to go and see your gynecologist, get assessed, and then provided there's no contraindications, which is true of over 90% of women, that you'll be able to be given some vaginal estrogen that you can use. And vaginal estrogen is available in a variety of uh, product bases or ranges, you can say. It's available as tablets, as pessaries, as creams, gels, even rings. It depends where you live, which of these products is available to you. So if you're in any doubt, go check with your medical practitioner about which products they can prescribe for you and which ones are available to you. Okay, here is the last question. How to maintain hygiene around vaginal area? Whether to use soap or not? This is a very common question and although I've addressed it partially in the previous answers, I'll say that yes, you can use soap and sometimes soap is all you have. But I would use the most pH neutral soap you can find. You don't want a very alkaline soap. You certainly don't want to use shampoo uh, over your vulva. Choose soaps that have a neutral pH and a high moisture content. Vulval hygiene is very important. So remember that uh, in women, women have a, a shorter urethra than men and they have the vaginal opening. So in women, if the area of the vulva is not kept clean, both the urethra and the entrance to the vagina can get access to infections. The key is to clean from front to back every time you pass urine or you pass tools and to not bring the bacteria around the anus towards the front. Also, it's important to empty your bladder before and after sex. Uh, to use um, underwear, that is cotton, avoid synthetic underwear. And at night, you can sleep without underwear. This allows air to circulate and allows any sweat to evaporate. And it can allow the skin to breathe a bit. It's very important to not use hair removal creams or to shave the area of the vulva because this can create small cuts and injuries in the skin, which can get easily infected. During periods, uh, it's important to make sure that the sanitary wear that you use is something that your skin is comfortable with, because sometimes the products in the sanitary wear, uh, you can end up becoming allergic to them. So if there's any kind of itching or burning at the vulva, or if you have very heavy periods and you're having to change your underwear a lot, Mm, or you're having to change sanitary towels very, very frequently, sometimes it can lead to soreness and burning. Go and see your gynecologist and get evaluated to find out how this problem can be managed or treated better. Sometimes using a small amount of Vaseline or coconut oil or olive oil on the area of the vulva can help it from becoming um, injured or sore easily. Uh, when you need to use sanitary towels more frequently. The other option is to shift to using tampons or a menstrual cup. And that can also reduce the amount of chaffing or rubbing on the vulva with uh, sanitary towels. If you're an athlete, it's even more important to maintain hygiene around the vulva and the vagina, uh, particularly because of the increased amount of sweating, the running and the chaffing that happens over the genitals. Uh, particularly if you're a cyclist, um, the pressure and the soreness that might happen because of the cycle seat. So all of these different practices need special care of the vulva. Um, I do cover this in my course on care of the vulva and vagina. And some of these tips are available in the book um, about menopause made easy as well. Soap is probably 
you know, the simplest answer. <laughs> I've, I know I've given a little bit more detailed answer in this, but um, I think it's important that women realize that looking after their vulva and vagina is not just about what you put inside it or on it. It's everything else you do, uh, including your nutrition, your hydration, uh, how much exercise you do, what kind of clothes you choose, what kind of detergent you use to, to wash your underclothes in. You know, things like uh, fabric softness can be incredibly irritating to vulva, to the vulval skin because it's so delicate. So it's important to pay attention to all this. There used to be a myth once upon a time that you couldn't use talcum powder mm, on the genitals. But in countries, you know, where it's very hot and your skin gets very sweaty and you don't always have the option of wearing really loose clothing, uh, then talcum powder is quite useful in mopping up some of the sweatiness of the area. But again, it's very important to, it, it brings me back to the point that where you live, you look at what the locals are wearing. <laughs> if the locals are wearing lots of warm clothes because it's too cold, then it'll probably be okay for you. But if the locals are wearing skirts and loose clothing and dresses and mostly in cotton, then maybe that's what you should be wearing. Remember to like, subscribe and share this podcast with whoever you think needs to hear it. If you'd like to talk to me one-on-one -on -one for a personal consultation, get in touch with me via my website, www.drnilima.com and you'll find a button there where you can click and book a slot with me. And I'll be sure to respond to any of your queries. Thank you. Disclaimer. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's or listener's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment.